Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, August the 15th, 2020. It is currently 11.08 a.m. Central Time. I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church, located here in Ovalo, Texas. And, well, I've got my Bible here. You can probably hear the pages. I've got my Bible here. I'm sitting here at the table in the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church. I did a live broadcast a little while ago talking about Christ. Christ Church, Caesar's Money. I was all controversial. Already started receiving emails. Um, so yeah, that created a lot of controversy. And so after I got done with that, I'm like, you know what? What do I do? What do I do right now? Um, I could pack everything up. I could pack everything up and just head back home. I, there's lo- so many things I need to do. I need to work on Genesis 5. I've got... Uh, Imitation of Christ over here that we need to get back to. Proverbs 3, there's so much, there's just so much I need to, to record and to do, but I, I am constantly aware that no matter what is going on, I need to constantly be taking time for my, you know, spend time in the scripture, devotional time, devotional study, devotional reading. Uh, Bible study for 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 my own personal spiritual edification. I am constantly aware of that fact, and and no matter how much how I am constantly aware of the fact, and then I constantly realize how so many things can get in the way, so many distractions, so many issues, so many things happening. Um, it's been it's been a, a crazy week. Um, you can I won't give any names, but you can pray uh, for one of our listeners. Um, her daughter struggling with cancer. Hospice has been called in. I haven't received an update. Um, just continue to pray for them. Yeah, horrible, horrible situation. Just pray, 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 pray. Um, God knows who I'm referring to. God knows the names. Uh, so please pray. I don't like to give any personal information. You know, uh, sometimes I will, but I, I, I don't like to unless I have specific permission. Uh, but we know this, our God is all-knowing, it's all-powerful. He knows exactly what's going on. So just pray uh, for the listener to the Theology Central podcast, all of our podcasts. Pray for her daughter, pray for cancer, pray for healing. If healing doesn't happen, pray for peace, comfort, strength. Uh, pray for the family, all the family members. Just pray for the entire situation. And uh, speaking of cancer, uh, we get notified from my brother, that there is concern of some possible cancer in my brother. Now, he's got to wait two weeks to he can get some tests. I guess some some things did not look right. Uh, there's some concern. He seems pretty, pretty concerned, pretty upset. Don't know exactly, don't know how bad the situation is right now. So I, I'm not going to, I don't want to make it sound worse than it is. It's troubling. It's concerning. So please pray for my brother. I do by no means have a close relationship with my brother rarely ever talk to him. So for, for us to get a message that this is going, I did call him. Um, and I obviously told him that, you know, um, I, I can go to any of his appointments with him. If this does turn into something bad, I'll go with him to, you know, to treatments. So just be praying for that entire situation. Bottom line is that's how life works. Uh, we all have issues going on. We all have struggles. We all have ups and downs and good days and bad days. Life constantly is coming at us. There's constant changes. No matter no matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter where you live, uh, that this is just what happens. Life happens, and we need stability in the midst of all of the things happening in our life. And the only stability that we're going to find is the stability that comes from us spending time, turning our attention, focusing on God's word, meditating on God's word, reading God's word you know, memorizing it, loving it. In fact, I'm way behind on my scripture memory. Um, I need to get back to the Bible memory app. I'm way behind on that. So I need to do some of that today. Um, and it's just all the normal distractions of life. Um, you know, I started the the uh, kind of a personal challenge, kind of a dare. I created a secular podcast just to see what would happen. And then that blew up into some massive success that I could not even comprehend or imagine. Um, still haven't gotten another sponsor so if I don't get a sponsor, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I proved the point. I was hoping I, I could, I could, you know, bring in a little extra money. It would be nice to bring in some extra money. But if I'm not going to get a sponsor, then all I'm doing is working on that podcast, which takes away from, you know, focus on, 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 on theology central focused, uh, 
takes away focus. I've, I've tried to do it in a way where it's not too demanding because I'm not, you know, spending any great amount of time doing any research or anything, but it, it does require, you know, that. So I, you know, that, that's got in the way and I'm still trying to process how to, to do that. And do I just get rid of it? I, you know, I proved the point that I wanted to make. And that is I could, I can have a massively successful podcast. I can. Um, I've had moderate success in the theology world, but I don't fit in in the theology world. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I look. I'm never. I hate. I hate the fact. This is what Christianity feels like to me. Christianity feels like to me. It feels like high school. And what do I mean? I didn't fit in at high school. I didn't go along. I didn't go along to get along. Even though when I was told by school counselors, you need to go along to get. I know. I called into question everything, everything everyone did. I didn't understand why we did this and did that and did that. Well, that's the way we've always done. It's what you do in high school. I don't have to go along with that. I don't have to follow that. And so um, because I questioned everything, I was the outsider and it, and it was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. I wouldn't go along. And when it comes to theology, what you have to do is you've got to find your your particular lane, your particular group, right? Your, your click, you've got to find them and you got to say, okay, like I'm reformed. So I've got to make all the reform people happy, say all the things to make reform people happy. But uh, you know, you learn really quick that you're not going to make all the reform people happy because even within the reform world, there's great division. Either you're going to baptize babies or not baptize babies. And if you say that baptizing babies are wrong, well then boom, you're done. So you either have to avoid the topic or try to, you know, play like a politician and say, well, I don't think it's wrong, but I don't do it. So, you know, so, or I believe the Bible allows for both or what, you know, you have to play some game there and I don't play that game. So that ticks off half of the reformed people uh, who get mad at me. And then the other half of the reformed people, I always say something there that I'm not reformed enough or say that. So then that doesn't work. Well, I'm obviously not going to fit in the world with the charismatics because I believe charismatic theology is a cancer that needs to be eradicated from Christianity. So that, that, that removes that group from me. So I don't fit in with the charismatic clique, gone. I don't really fit. I don't fit in in the reform clique, gone. I don't really fit in in the modern day evangelical clique. I don't fit in there. So I'm out. Um, the independent fundamental Baptist, I have some uh, connection with them because at my first school I went to was independent fundamental Baptist. And there's certain things there that I, I can fit at home. But then there's other things. I'm not by any means close. I, I'm buying, I, I definitely will not fit in with the independent fundamental Baptist world for very long. So basically, then where do I fit in? <laughs> I don't fit in anywhere, okay? So so as a result, you can't have the I can't have the same level of success of in other words being the top of the theology charts uh on Spotify or any other charts. I'm I'm just not going to pull that off. And that's that's frustrating. Um well, it's frustrating once you realize, man, I can have a successful podcast. I wish I could be successful in the theological world, but then you're like, "Wait a minute. The theological podcast is not about success. It's about just putting stuff out there and allowing God to use it any way he wants and hopefully producing something that is positive and helpful and spiritually edifying and getting people to think and challenging people. Um, and, and, and it requires, my program requires people of a very different mindset. They have to be willing to have their thoughts challenged. They have to be willing to have their perspective challenged because I'm typically going to say something that's going to irritate you that you're going to disagree with. I mean, if I make it two episodes and don't bother you, irritate you, or, or you disagree with me, I'm, I'm, I'm on a roll. But typically by the third episode, I'm back to making you mad. So like, so, you know, that, but that, you know what, the theology podcast, pastoring, theology, church, Bible, that's where, that's where my knowledge really is. That's where, you know, that's where I've spent my entire life studying, 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 studying. So, and that's, that's, I want, I wish I could accomplish something and significant within the Christian world. I really want to. So, that's where my focus really needs to be and wants to be. So uh, we'll see how the other podcast goes. But I, I say all of that, just trying to demonstrate that, yeah, um, life, I'm, I'm sitting here with all kinds of issues in life. And then I had the whole situation where people came into the church, messed up the sermon, which threw Genesis 5 into complete disarray. And I don't know if I'm ever going to get back on track with that, which threw the whole VBC Bible Institute journey through the Bible in a little bit of delay. So that, that's been very troubling and discouraging. So I'm, 
I'm just trying to get through all of that. And I know the, this is what I learned. When you're sitting there with all of those thoughts, see how all of those thoughts are going. And the more I talk, the more thoughts I could throw out, more issues here. And I'm struggling with this and I'm working on this. I could, all of that's just noise. And sometimes you have to say, that's it. All of that noise, you've been dismissed. You get out of my house. You get out of my life. You go outside, you go play in the yard, you go stay, you go stand in the corner for about 30 minutes because I am going to turn my attention to scripture, focus on scripture, set, uh, you know, in a sense, rest my mind from all of that noise and then focus it and center it on Christ and his word and then grow spiritually because I need that spiritual foundation. I need that spiritual rock to stand on, all right? And so that's what I'm going to do here. We're going to have a little devotional time. I know that's been a little long time in that introduction, but that's okay. It, fe- it feels like it's been a year since I've been behind this microphone just talking about what I want to talk about. I feel like I've had to deal with so many issues, COVID-19 and, and, and all the craziness happening with that. And I just saw a survey of how many pastors are really getting weary and tired and frustrated and depressed and discouraged by everything that's happening. And so... um so, but you know what? The only solution to that is to stop with all of that and get right back to the scripture. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pick up a scriptural thought that I mentioned on Wednesday. Wednesday night, uh, everything went crazy at the church. There was no internet connection. So uh, because there was no internet connection, I had to, uh, I, I, basically I couldn't have a live streaming service at church. So I went home and I looked for every opportunity to like, okay, I think I can keep the dog quiet for about 20 minutes. Let's turn on the microphone and throw out something because I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, have nothing there for Wednesday night. I, I can't, I, I hate when church, when church doesn't happen, it bothers me greatly. It should bother all Christians, all right? So, you know, even if we can't meet in person, I still want to get something, you know, live on the air if I can. So I did a little devotional thought and it didn't generate any response which is discouraging, but I, it, it's generated a lot of thought in my mind. And that's this idea that in Scripture, we seem to see on a number of occasions, Satan using Scripture as a weapon to try to hurt, destroy, cause problems for people. All right, We obviously see Satan coming into the garden, utilizing the serpent to speak to Eve. And he begins to question. He begins to talk about God's word, what God had said. Did God really say this? He, he, he uses his citation and references to what God had said, to God's words, to create confusion and ultimately to manipulate to rebellion. When he, att- when he comes after Jesus, which is just a bizarre a bizarre story that here's Jesus, the eternal son of God, and Satan comes to Jesus and he utilizes scripture to try to get Jesus to commit sin. He utilizes scripture, utilizes God's word. And it's just interesting that that's how Satan seems to operate. Now, it's interesting. It shouldn't be too surprising because we have this scripture, 2 Corinthians. You know this scripture. 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 13, for such are false apostles, so here Paul is warning and identifying that there are those who are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So you have false apostles who transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. They act like they're the apostles of Christ. So they're going to use scripture. They're going to preach scripture. They're going to teach scripture. But in reality, they are false apostles, deceitful workers. But they've transformed themselves into the apostles of Christ. But what are they going to be using? They're going to be using scripture. They're going to be using the Bible to teach falsehood, to manipulate people. They're going to be using the Bible. And then verse 14, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Don't be shocked by this. Don't be surprised because Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That's how Satan appears. He's going to appear as an angel of light. But guess what he's going to utilize, I, I think, over and over is the, he's going to use scripture. And we have to realize sometimes scripture is being used by pastors and Christians, 
not in a way that is edifying, helpful, beneficial, but they actually use it. That They are, in a sense, working, whether intentionally or not intentionally, they're actually doing Satan's work. They're using scripture that creates division, schism, pain, hurt, despair, depression, discouragement, destruction, you know, spiritual, you know, in a sense, death. And we have to be aware that we don't use scripture that way. And we've got to be aware of Satan's schemes. We can't be ignorant of his devices. We can't. Satan will do this. He uses scripture. And so I've been really meditating on this idea. Okay, how have I ever used scripture and didn't use it correctly? I can probably think of some ways. Did I use it correctly? Did I not use it correctly? Did, did I did I use it in order to hurt, to destroy? Was that my intention or did I do it unintentionally? Did I use scripture ever to justify my own actions? Like we, scripture is a sword, right? It's a sword um, and a sword and in any kind of weapon, gun, sword, you got to use it carefully or you can end up hurting yourself and hurting others. You can use that weapon in a defensive manner or you can use it in an off- offensive manner. You can do it to protect and preserve life, or you can use a weapon to hurt, destroy, kill, and, and end life. Like, the Bible is a sword, and we, we sometimes we, tr- we, we don't realize that we're utilizing it in a, in a way that's in accord with Satan. Satan has no problem with the use of Scripture, as long as if the Scripture is used in a way to hurt and destroy people, not to, do, not to bring life and peace, and joy, and spirituality, and righteousness. That doesn't mean the scripture can't be used as a rebuke. It can't, doesn't mean the scripture can't be used to, to condemn, because it can and should be at times. But we got to make sure we're not using it in the wrong way. So I started, as I started thinking about this, just going through scripture, right? And I'm like, I'm just going to start in Matthew, and just look at when, whenever scripture is being used by someone in kind of a, a wrong way. And I ended up in Matthew 12. I ended up in Matthew 12, and I think I'm going to pick up this idea tomorrow um, for, um, for church tomorrow. I think, I think I am, because I think this is just a very important concept, all right? Matthew chapter 12, and at that time, all right, so, well, in fact, if you, if you want to look at this, I think this is really interesting. If you go back to Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11. And if we start in verse 28, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, these are very famous uh, words spoken by Jesus, but I think they really set up Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 11, start in verse 28. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Please note two times. Come unto all, to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. So there's this promise of rest. There's this promise of rest. Now, let me see something. I'm going to look at something really quick just to see if this is true because I've got the thought, but I want to verify it before I say it out loud. Let's go to the New Testament, go to Matthew. We'll go to chapter 11. We'll go all the way down here to 28. I'm going to pull up my antilinear. Okay, it's a different, uh, it, the Greek word is not, it's not what I thought, all right? Um, I bet you if we looked up it in the Septuagint, it would be, and make, sure, and make sure it doesn't use a different word here. Verse 29, see if it uses the same word for rest. Yeah, okay, it uses the Greek word, obviously it uses the Greek word. So um, I just wanted to make sure, I believe if we look that up in the, um, I believe if we look that up in the Septuagint, give me one second. Give me one second. Let me see here. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Here's how one translation puts it. Jesus, okay, well, before we get to chapter 12, uh, the Hebrew word sabbat, S-A-B-A-T, means repose or rest, which explains why Matthew introduced the Sabbath conflicts at this point, because in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus offers rest to all who will come unto him. So there is no, there is no rest in mere religious observances. So in, in Matthew 11, Jesus talks about rest. He uses the Greek word, but if we were to look at it, uh, the, the Hebrew, there would be sabbat, this idea of rest, repose. Jesus talks about this rest in Matthew chapter 11. And then right when we get to chapter 12, we get into a conflict, an argument about rest or about the Sabbath. All right. Now let's remember that, I mean, it it doesn't, I mean, everyone here knows this. The Sabbath is established in the Old Testament. There's no question about it. And so whenever you deal with the Sabbath, you're dealing with scripture, right? We, we are, we have all the Sabbath rules in the Old Testament. There's no question about it. They're there. You can read them. So whenever you get ready to talk about the Sabbath, that's scripture, that's scripture. So Jesus is getting ready to find himself in conflict with those who want to use a scriptural concept and a scriptural idea to get into an argument. And look at this. So in Matthew 11, Jesus offers rest, if you'll come unto him. In Matthew chapter 12, look what happens. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day uh, through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of the corn and to eat. Right? So it's the Sabbath day. Jesus just promised rest in the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12, it's the Sabbath day. They're supposed to be resting. They're walking uh, through the corn. His disciples are hungry, so they just begin to pluck the ears of the corn and eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. So they're like, wait, 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 wait. You can't do that. Now, they're going to utilize scriptural. They're, they're borrowing from a scriptural argument. Now, some will say, well, they're borrowing from the tradition they added to the scripture. Well, guess what? Millions of Christians run around with the scriptures claiming it's the scripture that they're using. But in many cases, it's their own tradition, their own interpretation, and their own application. And they use scripture then as a weapon. And how do they use the scriptural concept of the Sabbath against Jesus? Well, they're, gonna, they're getting ready to, they're saying that what you're doing is unlawful. Jesus begins to respond to them, right? And then look at what happened at the, at the end of this entire discussion because uh, they're, they're going to get into a different, they're getting into the question about the, 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 the corn and plucking the ears of the corn. And then Jesus departs, look in verse nine, he went into their synagogue and behold, there was a man which had in his hand withered and they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? that they might accuse him. So again, they, it's the Sabbath. Got, they've got this biblical concept, the Sabbath, but they're not utilizing this to try to find truth. They're, trying to try, no, they're not using this idea in order to try to help or benefit anyone spiritually. They've got the Sabbath in mind and they're going to use this. Look that they might accuse him. They've got scripture and they're, they just got the scripture there not to try to help, not to try to restore, not to try to benefit. They've got scripture there that we can, we're going to use the Old Testament. We're going to use this principle to accuse Jesus. And sometimes people, a lot of Christians run around with the Bible simply as a tool, as a hammer, as a, as a sledgehammer that they can use it to bash people over the head and destroy lives. But they quoted scripture, mind you. They quoted scripture. But I think that's just using it as Satan does as a weapon. Satan wasn't using scripture to benefit Jesus. He was using scripture to try to trap Jesus, to get Jesus to do that which was against God's will. That's not the way it should, it, it should work or operate. So here becomes now about healing. And then note how this whole situation ends. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. Then when the Pharisees went out and held a council, then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him how they might destroy him. Many Christians, their Bible study time is time to get information so that they can go out and accuse and destroy people. When your use of the Bible basically amounts to nothing more than accusing and destroying, you've missed, I think that's a major problem. Now, the Bible at times is to be used to speak words of rebuke and correction and condemnation. But those same, the same book that may offer words of rebuke and condemnation is the same book that should be used to call for 
restoration. And it's the same book that should be used to, to restore, to bring healing, to bring forgiveness, to bring people back. But we sometimes use it just to hurt people, and that is incorrect. They're using the Sabbath here. And, and look, they had some, some. They had at least a, a part, in part some biblical, uh, you know, um, a ground. How, how could we say it? They, they they had a biblical leg to stand upon. And here's the reason why. Uh, look at Numbers, Numbers chapter fifteen, verses thirty-two to thirty-six. Numbers chapter fifteen, thirty-two to thirty-six. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and all to the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones and he died. Well, there's, there's, there, they've got a scriptural example of someone being killed, someone being destroyed for violating the Sabbath. They, hey, they were gathering sticks. Well, it doesn't matter why. They were killed, violated the rules. So they take that concept, ignore everything else that the Bible may say, ignore any other context, ignore everything else, and like, we're going to use the Sabbath. Jesus wants to offer rest. Well, we're not coming to Jesus to get rest. We're going to come to Jesus. We're going to use the Sabbath the Sabbat, we're going to use this concept of rest and we're going to use it against Jesus. We're going to, we're going to use it against him to accuse him and destroy him. Now, again, the Bible does offer condemnation. I am no way saying it doesn't. It offers rebuke, but with the, act, with the condemnation and the rebuke is also in the Bible uh, uh, the promise of forgiveness, of restoration, being healed, being brought back into our right relationship with God. I'm talking spiritual healing, to, to, to heal us, to bring us back, to restore us so that we, we can be brought back to a position of usefulness. But what some scriptures, Christians do is the Bible, man, I'm going to use this to destroy you. I'm going to use this. Some Christians, when they start arguing, they want to use the Bible simply as a, as a weapon to win an argument, to win a debate, to destroy someone. And it's like, whoa, 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 we're, we're, getting, we're getting away from, that's, that's Satan's territory. Satan uses the Bible to hurt. Satan uses the Bible to destroy. Satan uses the Bible to confuse. Satan uses the Bible as a, a, a weapon to, to try to hurt and to try to destroy people. We can't do that. We cannot do that. We have to be careful of that. So here's what I want you to do. I, I, I think it's interesting. In Matthew chapter 12, I'm just going to give you this kind of a little devotional assignment if you want to, uh, to dig in a little bit. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus speaks in verse 3, all right? But he said unto them, have you not read what David did when he was hungered and, and they that were with him. You may want to circle the word David there, all right? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, but neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day, the priest and the temple uh, profane, uh, profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known uh, what this meaneth, I would have co- I, w- I would have mercy and not sacrifice. You would have not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So please note, here's what I think is interesting. Jesus uses David, a king, in his argument. He uses the priest in his argument. And then... And Matthew 12, 7, let me look here real, really quick. I could be wrong. Matthew 12, 7, I, I know, live devotional studies are, I love doing this. Some people don't because it's just real me just sitting here having my own devotional study. And some pe- people like when I do this and people don't, but that's okay. Um, I believe... He is quoting in Matthew 12, 7. Am I right? Is he quoting, is it Hosea? 
Let me look here. I've got to look here. I could be wrong. You say, uh, let me look. Six. Okay, uh, yeah, Hosea 6, 6. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Okay, so in Matthew 12, when Jesus says, um, for if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. So it looks like in, in, in Matthew 12, 7, Jesus is quoting Hosea 6, 6. He may also be quoting Micah. Uh, is he quoting Micah? Let me see here. Let's look here. I could be wrong. I don't want to say. Let me look here. Haggai. Zephaniah. Look, look me here. I'm trying to hold this big Bible in one hand while well, I'm trying to find what I'm looking for here. Micah 6.6. 6. Let's see here. Yes. Uh, well, okay. It's kind of the same uh, idea in Micah 6, 6 verses, or Matthew, uh, Micah 6, 6 and uh, verse 7 and verse 8. Um, O oh man, what is uh, he hath showed thee, O oh man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Okay, so it's kind of the same concept. So let me go back to Matthew chapter 12. Because I think there's an interesting thing being developed here in, in the text. And I, I haven't got, got it completely worked out, but I, I'll, I'll show it to you and then you can, you can study it for yourself. Okay, so in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus speaks of rest, right? This leads to now two conflicts that arise over the Sabbath. Jesus does these things and the religious leaders come and they want to use the Sabbath. They want to use the scriptural law of the Sabbath and they want to use it to accuse Jesus and ultimately to destroy him, to kill him. They want to use a scriptural, they want to use scripture in order to accuse and ultimately to kill Jesus. I want you to just think about that. Is that not falling into the hands of Satan? I'm going to use scripture to find a way to get someone killed, to find a way that I can make sure someone dies. That's not the biblical way of handling scripture. But as Christians, we use scripture to accuse, to hurt, to kill, and destroy. And we forget all the scriptures about love, mercy, restoration, forgiveness, help. No, we, it, it's like Christians run around just using the Bible as a weapon to beat anyone over the head they can with, all right? Now, with all of that said, when Jesus offers his argument, he does a very, it's a very interesting development here. So David, you can circle David in verse three, you can circle, um, let me see here. You can circle, what do we want here? You can circle the word priest in verse five. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day, the priest, so he uses the king, he uses the priest. And then in verse seven, if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. In verse seven, he uses the words of the prophet or prophets. So in a sense, Jesus uses the argument of king. Or we'll, we'll do it in reverse order. Prophet, priest, and king. He uses an argument about the Sabbath, utilizing the words of a prophet, utilizing law about the priest, and utilizing the actions of a king. Prophet, priest, and king, which is fascinating to me because when we speak of the offices of Jesus, he's prophet, he's priest, and he's king. So Jesus is going to use prophet, priest, and king to, to give a correct understanding of the Sabbath, the Sabbath law, how it should be utilized in order to argue against people who are using a scriptural principle, scriptural scripture, in order to accuse him and try to kill him. Now, exactly how he uses the argument of prophet, priest, and king, I've got to flesh out a little bit. I'm going to do that tonight, and I think I'm going to use this for a, a, a sermon tomorrow because I'm really fascinated by this concept. But I just want you to give this some thought. So here's what I want you to do to end this devotional thought. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself, when it comes to Scripture, have you found you either being 
the victim of people who use the scripture simply to try to accuse and destroy you? And have you found yourself ever using scripture in a way that's more in line with how Satan uses it than what God would want us to use it? Yes, we can use scripture to say that is wrong and condemn it. But with the condemnation, we say, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if you are a Christian, confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And those of us who are spiritual to restore you back to a rightful, you know, a, a useful place to restore you according to the scripture. Uh, we, we need to bear one another's burdens. We need to forgive. We need to love. Love covers a multitude of sins. There's like, there's all these other scriptures that we, we overlook. How, have you been guilty ever of basically using scripture like Satan. And then when we need an example of how the religious leaders handled handled scripture in Matthew 12, here they come along. Jesus just announced, hey, come to me and you get rest. They're like, oh, you want to talk about rest? You want to talk about Sabbat? You want to talk about repose and rest? Well, okay, we're going to talk about the Sabbath. And we're going to talk about the Sabbath. And then there's two conflicts arise. Now, Jesus institutes the conflict, all right? But I, I won't say he did it on purpose. His disciples are the one who were hungry and they they grabbed the food. They didn't clearly believe they were violating anything, but the religious leaders show up and the religious leaders start making accusations. And then they ask him about something pertaining, healing someone on the Sabbath in order to accuse. They don't care about someone being healed. They don't care about a person physical ailment. No, all they care about is using scripture to attack someone. And then ultimately they set out to destroy him. They hold a council to destroy him. And what are they? They're going to use scriptural arguments to try to have an innocent man killed. They're going to use scriptural arguments in order to try to have an innocent man, to ultimately have the eternal son of God, true God and true man, killed. That's so twisted. And right now during COVID-19, everyone wants to grab a Bible and everybody wants to quote a verse about what you should and shouldn't do, all acting like they've got it figured out. And I think sometimes they just want to make, make a point and make an argument and win a debate more than they care about actual people and using scripture in a loving, caring, God-glorifying way. And then Jesus steps up and says, hey, you want to argue about the Sabbath? Well, let's talk about the words of a prophet. Let's talk about the law pertaining to the priest and let's talk about the actions of a king. And I think that's just fascinating because that's the threefold office that we often talk about when it comes to Christ. So, all right, I'll stop right there. I know uh, the devotional thoughts are not always completely laid out, but I just want to throw that out there to you. And um, I I know my my devotionals are in real time. So when I come up with an idea, I'm like, oh, I got to look that up. Then you got to sit there and listen to me uh, turn the page. What happened is I picked, picked up this huge Bible so you'd study Bible. And the reason I grabbed it is because I figured it would have a cross references because the Bible that I use for my devotional studies have no cross references in them because I like to have Bibles with no notes. But I'm like, oh, I need to, I need to know where that cross re- – because I know Jesus in Matthew 12, 7 was referencing the words of a prophet. I just didn't know where. So I needed to verify it. So they're live on the air picking up this huge Bible, and I'm trying to hold it with one hand and trying to turn it uh, – because I'm talking into the microphone and the microphone's in the way. So I'm like, ugh. So that's why it took me forever to find the scripture. Because that thing is, that Bible weighs like 975 pounds and that's not even hyperbole. Okay, well, maybe it is, but I, you get the idea. So I apologize for that delay there, but that's the, that's the point of doing my devotional in real time. It's real. It's not all rehearsed and planned out. So um, if you were here, that's what we would be doing in real time. We'd be looking that scripture up and thinking about it. So here's your Here's your opportunity. What do you think about Matthew 12? What do you think about Jesus using the argument of a prophet and a priest and a king in order to fight uh, this, this scriptural argument about the Sabbath? And what do you think, uh, what do, you, do you find it interesting that Matthew 12 gives us two Sabbath conflicts right after Jesus declared, come unto, come unto him, all you who labor and, and heavy laden, and he would give you rest. Don't you find that fascinating that that's where the, the story is placed? I think it is very important and very powerful, and uh, well, we're, we're gonna we'll, we'll pull all of that together tomorrow and see what we can uh, what we can discover. All right, I'll stop right there. Email me newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, everyone, have a great day. Please pray for the listener and her daughter and her family. Um, cancer. Uh, you can pray for my brother. We don't know for sure if it's cancer. The doctors seem really concerned, so it seems like that's going to be a, a great possibility. Hoping it's not. Please pray for that. And uh, 
just, uh, yeah, just pray for everyone around the world. So much going on. And just remember, whatever is happening, you need to take time and get your mind on the scriptures. That's what you have to do. That's the only, that's the foundation. That's the only, that's the only sure ground you can stand on is what the scriptures say. Emotions, feelings, and circumstances will just lead you on a roller coaster ride. Get your feet firmly planted on the foundation that is God's word. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great day. God bless.